Chapter 1 Region 7 With eyes that refused to open, all he could do was listen to the sounds around him. The sounds of people whispering, sniffling, and crying. At that moment, Jim wondered if he really wanted his eyes to open, not only because of the sounds, but also because of the images that rushed back to him of what had happened before everything had faded away into darkness. The images of townspeople waving at him and his best friend, Larry, to run away, speeding away in the car, Larry being killed, then having those people who killed Larry come after him while he did nothing. No, Jim preferred to stay in the darkness rather than face the world he was now part of, a world that seemed to become more dangerous each time he opened his eyes. Slowly, Jim forced his eyelids to open, knowing this time would be no different, but also knowing he could not stay in the darkness forever. Looking around, he could see men, women, and children huddled together as more were forced onto the bus. As more were shoved on, those in the aisle were packed tighter to the rear. Children had to be raised up from where they stood to ensure they were not smothered, as every inch of space was filled with another person being brought on board. Jim could feel hands wrapping around his upper arms and raising him from where he was seated midway down the bus. I think he is awake, Jim heard a voice say, assuming it was from one of those helping him stand. Yeah, looks to still be just a little unsteady, another said. Good. We need you to move over into the seat to make room for the old and young, the same voice said to him. The voice sounded very familiar to him, yet he could not make out the man's face. Larry? Jim asked, realizing whose voice he was hearing. Then the man's voice began to change and become deeper. No, sorry. My name is Kevin. What is yours? Kevin asked as he continued to move Jim over for three children to get in. As Jim listened to the man's voice change, he knew it had to be from the blow to his head he received from the UN soldiers. With his motor skills quickly returning, Jim was able to remain standing with his back to the window of the bus unassisted and bracing himself with his hands clasped atop of the seat backs to his left and right. Jim looked up to Kevin. I think I am good now, man. You sure? You took a pretty good blow to the skull, Kevin said, knowing it did not matter since he was being pushed farther to the back of the bus as more people were loaded. Jim looked down at the children who had been shoved between the two seats where he now stood with his back curving with the contours of the bus. He tried to think back to when he was their age and what it would be like at eight or nine years of age to go through this. The thought didn't last long since he knew that, no matter how hard he tried, it wouldn't even come close to what they were feeling. He wanted to tell them everything was going to be okay, but with the blood of his best friend splattered upon his clothing not even dry yet, Jim could not get the words to pass through his lips. Reaching out with his left hand, Jim gave one of them what he hoped was a soothing pat on the back, an action that would normally relay that everything was going to be okay. But to the children, it seemingly went unnoticed. Jim could feel the bus begin to move forward. As it did, moans came from all over the bus as people were forced even tighter together from the acceleration. After what Jim could only guess was close to an hour's ride, he felt the bus beginning to slow. Even without having a clear view out a window, he could see what appeared to be a tall fence through gaps as people moved slightly side to side. Is this the place they are taking us to? Jim asked to anyone who would answer. No. They told us when they first came to town that it was a temporary resettlement camp, a young woman around Jim's age replied. Sure doesn't look like a temporary one to me, Jim said as he braced himself, feeling the bus come to a complete stop. Yeah, we came to believe they were lying once they began rounding up everyone who had firearms first. It wasn't long before people started fighting back. After that, they began rounding everyone up to put on buses. By the way, my name is Dawn. How about yours? Deep down, Jim was screaming at himself not to give Dawn his name or talk with her any longer out of fear of becoming friends and once again losing another person in his life. Before he could suppress his natural need to connect with others, he had already said, Jim. Now the voice in his subconscious grew louder, only this time it was not saying anything but screaming. Well, Jim, on a normal day I would say, 
Good to meet you. But as you have seen, things have not been normal for a while. Jim slightly shook his head and exhaled as he thought. A normal day now is somebody I know being killed. Though we didn't hear any orders given, Jim felt the bus rocking as people began getting off. After what seemed like minutes passing without movement in the aisle next to him, Jim could see people gaining a little breathing room as others exited. Jim watched as Kevin began moving closer on his way off the bus. Even though they had only said a few words to each other, Jim suddenly had a need to follow him. As he tried to keep track of Kevin's location in the group, Jim began getting a better look at the place they had arrived. Fencing stood at least twenty feet high with razor wire atop it, and towers where men with weapons watched out over the ground stood at every few hundred feet, and that was just the perimeter. From what Jim could see, everything was concrete, and the buildings were massive, reminding him of pictures he had seen in the history books of Soviet housing during the Cold War. Soon it was Jim's turn to exit as people made room for the children to go in front of them, ensuring that they were surrounded by adults at all times. Ready to see our new home? Kevin asked as he approached Jim's seat from the back of the bus, where he had been pushed by others boarding. From what I have seen already, no, Jim replied very sarcastically. Now, with room to move, Jim looked out the bus window and saw that all were being put in two lines next to one another. Jim wondered if these people even knew what was happening on the West Coast, if they had any idea that the United States was being invaded, as he continued to make his way to the front of the bus. Coming to the door, passing the well-armed driver and making his way down the steps to where yet another blue-helmeted soldier stood, Jim thought against trying to inform these two of the invasions. As he looked at the two men, Jim's instincts were telling him to keep eyes forward and mouth closed, so he followed them and kept moving with Kevin directly in front of him. He must eat a lot of steak and potatoes, Jim could not help but think as he walked over to the line with the others, unable to see much around Kevin's broad back and towering height. Okay, people. For your safety and everyone else's safety, we need the women in one line and men in the other. First part of the processing is delousing. You will enter and remove your clothing, walk through the sprayers and put on new clothes. Then you will meet each other on the other side. One of the guards called out to get moving, though Jim still could not see much more than Kevin's back. People began moving from one line to the next, and Jim suddenly brimmed with the fear of being alone. Even though he did not know the large man who was about his age, he at least had already spoken to him, and so he tried staying close as the shuffling between the lines continued. Once all the moving between lines had stopped, Jim found himself one person away from Kevin as he thought, Well, it sure isn't hard to keep an eye on him. As the line began moving, Jim looked around, taking in every bit of information that he could about where they had been taken. A little ways down the fence, he spotted a few turnstile doors with personnel wearing military-style uniforms but no blue helmets. As the two passed by, Jim could tell they were Americans, and he could barely make out the patch on their shoulder that read, CERT. Before he could see much more, his line was led into a building just inside the gate. There were two doors almost side by side, and Jim watched as the girl he met on the bus entered the door with the rest of her line just as he entered the same building. Jim prepared himself for a dark room since the building had no windows and there was no electricity. After passing through the door, Jim was astounded by the brightness of the lights, almost as if seeing the wonder of electricity for the first time. It wasn't until then that Jim realized how much he took something as great as electricity for granted. Almost as soon as they entered the facility, personnel began shouting orders. Remove your clothes and place them in the blue bags. Five people per bag, with a marker. Write your name on them. Once they are cleaned, they will be returned. Jim looked around the room at all the complete strangers as he quickly began removing his clothing. Feels like I am back in gym class, he thought to himself, as he focused on the bag Kevin was putting his clothes in. The large man's hand released his clothes into the bag as one of the personnel walked by with it held open. Jim had counted three others placed their clothes in the bag before Kevin. Understanding that the guy standing in line between them was the fifth, Jim quickly balled his clothes up and threw them much like shooting a free-throw shot to win the big game. 
as his clothes hit the bag, almost jerking it free from the hands of the facility personnel holding it. Jim figured it would be a good time to start playing dumb. Oh, he said, looking between the man holding the bag and the guy next to him, with a confused look on his face. Shit! I am so sorry. I thought it was my turn, I... Just as he figured what happened, he was cut off. Just switch spots. I haven't got time for this shit. As Jim switched spots with the guy next to him, he was handed a marker. Print your name on the bag and follow your group through the sprayers, the man said in a monotone voice, as if he had said it thousands of times before. Once finished signing his name, Jim turned and walked with the others who had placed their clothing in the same bag, and through the sprayers they walked. It wasn't until they were on the other side that they wondered what the stuff was. They were now spitting from their mouths and attempting to wipe from their eyes. Put this on and move through the yellow door, another facility worker said as he handed each of them a light yellow jumpsuit and flip-flops. After putting on the jumpsuit, Jim stood waiting on Kevin to finish before exiting through the door. You ready to see what's next, Jim? Kevin asked while sliding his feet into the flip-flops he had dropped to the floor in front of him. Well, I don't see that we have any other choice, Jim replied, turning to follow Kevin to the door. Above the door, a sign read, Welcome to FEMA Camp, 1187 Region 7, 